the first webinar is on the fair infrastructure for structural and functional annotations and also for predicted structure model data and i'll explain that as i go along uh, so just a couple of slides on the 3d bioinfo community uh, we are trying to bring together the structural bioinformatics community and the aim is to establish a platform that addresses their needs and also better integrates the activities and initiatives uh, that run uh, in, in different places across Europe. Uh, and the main goals are uh, to promote and develop data standards, data integration, um, and of structural data, as well as predicted structure models and associated annotations. Obviously, as we uh, integrate different methods, benchmarking becomes important and so that's another important goal um, and we also want to make sure that the integration is related to biological data and biological context and produce some training material as well so 3d bioinfo community has five activities and as i said the first activity is related to infrastructure for structural and functional annotations and that's what we will hear about more uh, in this uh, today. And uh, other activities have similar, similar webinars uh, later in the year. OK, so let's, let's start. And let's start with uh, understanding where molecular and cellular structures are archived and where they come from. Um, as you all may know, PDB, which is the oldest uh, archive, of structural data. It was established in 1971, and it, it archives data at atomic resolution structures. Uh, EMDB, which was established in 2002, uh, archives data from electron microscopy experiments. The electric potential maps go into EMDB, uh, and the associated models go into PDB. And Empire is the, the latest archive uh, that uh, archives raw images from electron microscopy data um, and links them back to EMDB as well. So what we want to achieve with um, getting these structures uh, is first of all, have good quality structures, add additional information and put those structures into biological context so that we could derive some kind of biological inference from the number of structures that are available. So this is this is the usual uh, researchers' idea of uh, getting data, adding extra information to it, uh, and putting it in the biological context to to derive knowledge. And that's the main goal for PDBE knowledge base as well, which is the core archive for the activity one. Uh, the aim is to uh, place macromolecular structure data in its biological context. Uh, and this is a community driven integrated resource of structural and functional annotations. So we get structure data from the PDB, which is managed by the WWPDB consortium, uh, but there are many, many data resources which take those structures and add annotations to those multiple structures in the PDB. And in PDB KB, the idea is similar to structure deposition in the PDB, the annotations are deposited to PDB knowledge base. And so we might find ourselves having multiple annotations from different data resources for the same residues or the same protein. And in PDB knowledge base, then we try and integrate this data, both the structures and associated annotations in one place uh, so that users can um, exploit the, the information. So right now we have about 28 partner resources from 11 different countries, and they have contributed about 1.2 billion annotations, residue level annotations for structures that are in the PDB. And on the right-hand side here, you can see the different types of annotations 
that have been contributed by some of the partner resources. So just to say where these partners are, as you can see, it's not just restricted to Europe. There are partners in US, there are partners in Asia. And the, the major benefit of this is for users, obviously, because they can access diverse data uh, on a unified platform. And more importantly, in a standardized data format. So you don't have to learn different ways of accessing data. You can get it from one place. The partner resources themselves who have put in a lot of work in adding annotations, get better visibility. Uh, and their work has much more impact because that's been used by many more users. And obviously we benefit from providing a, a better service with enriched data uh, to, to our users. So how do we integrate all this data? So each week we get both structures and the annotations from our partner resources and we have developed a graph database in-house based on Neo4j technology, uh, which contains a representation for the PDB structure, but also links it to the sequence information from Uniprot and also the annotations from Uniprot, uh, as well as the functional annotations that we get from our partner resources. And so this knowledge graph allows you to traverse all these different entities and query them to derive knowledge. We then make the database also available using APIs and we have developed what we call aggregated views. And I'll explain that uh, in, in the next few slides. So the aggregated views is bringing together all the information we have for a given protein uh, in, in one place. So the idea is PDB may have number of structures. Uh, there may be many, many ligands uh, that bind and interact with this particular protein. And it may also have very similar structures available in the PDB. Um, and obviously the best way to uh, make most of all this data is to look at it in one place and, and compare it, contrast it, what is the difference between different uh, entries, what is similarities, et cetera, to understand the function of that particular protein. So the aggregated views bring all that together, uh, but it also brings together relevant publications. And these are not just from PDB, but also other relevant publications from Uniprot or reviews that might cite uh, some of these structures. Um, so it brings all that information in one place. It allows you to download the relevant subset of structures. So for example, if you click on this download button, you get all the PDB structures. But if you click on this download, you will only download structures that contain ligands. And so it allows you to quickly get a set of structures that are relevant for your research. Uh, I will go into this superposed structures in, in the slides uh, a bit later. So this is just showing an example of a section on this aggregated views. Here I'm showing, showing the SARS uh, proteinase structure. And as you might have heard, there was a big fragment screening experiment done at Diamond in, in UK uh, to design new molecules that might inhibit this protein. So on this page, you can see all the unique ligands that might bind a particular protein, but you can also see where exactly they bind. So here it is showing the sequence of the protein and the residues are highlighted where multiple ligands bind. So this is a kind of summary view. If you expand it, you can see which residues interact with a particular ligand as well. Uh, you can download all this information, but what is nice is you can see this in a superposed manner. So this is now bringing together all the ligands from the whole PDB for this particular protein 
and showing it where exactly they bind. And you can start seeing then particular patterns. For example, this is a site where you can see there are many, many ligands binding, as well as from the fragment screening experiment, you can see there are multiple fragments. And so obviously this site is of interest for designing a molecule that might also inhibit the function or modulate the function. So PDB-EKB allows you to answer scientific questions uh, in an in a easy way, or at least provides all the relevant information that may allow you to uh, answer some scientific questions. Uh, so for example, as I have already shown, can you find all the ligand binding sites? Uh, does my protein in, of interest display multiple conformations? And what are those? Or can I find small molecules, which for example, are very similar or share the same scaffold and interact with the same binding site? And then you can try and understand what are the differences in the binding or what are the similarities in the binding. And you can do all similarly for uh, interacting interfaces as well. So I'm going to give just one example of the small molecule. So the question is, can we find small molecules which have or share the same scaffold, i.e. they are more or less same or, and interact in the same binding site. Uh, you can use the, the graph database, the knowledge base to answer this question, but also link it to other annotations like, is the binding site annotated as catalytic site? Are the small molecules drug-like? Or how conserved are the, the residues in the binding sites? So here is one example that you might get if you do the query. Um, so this is erythromycin and clarithromycin. You can see there is a difference of this one particular atom in, in, in this. Uh, otherwise, the molecules are same. And you can also start seeing where the binding sites are and identify residues that might interact with one but not the other. So you can start looking at and analyzing structure data, not one structure at a time, but by looking at all the structure information in one go. So this is about the structural and functional annotations. But if you look in the PDB, we have a very small number of uniproduct sessions in the PDB. So for now, we have about 55,000 unique Uniprot accession represented in the PDB. And that spans about 9,000 9, PFAN families, but there are many more and definitely many, many more Uniprot accessions. And as we have seen in the past uh, couple of years, the structure prediction methods are becoming better and better. Um, these are now used quite regularly in structure determination. The models if we get the predicted models, we can provide improved coverage of sequence space. And already there are many different data resources and servers that have this information available. But the problem there is that each resource might have their own APIs and they might also have their own data formats. So this was the, the goal of establishing or, or the motivation behind establishing 3D beacons. Can we design and implement an infrastructure for making all the structural data, not just data from PDB, but also the predicted models available to our users? So what we do is to register resources that provide structural data. We then have developed standards for data exchange and created data access mechanisms as well. And the the outcome of this is to reduce the fragmentation and allow users to access all the information easily through a standardized portal. How can we use this? Uh, so we, we gathered quite a few use cases here. There are some. Uh, so you could try and get a protein structure to understand the effect of variant uh, using the model 
that you get and the annotations that you get from knowledge base. Uh, you may use the structured information uh, for tractability as ass assessment or simply use it as a model for molecular replacement or fitting into cryo EM map. So there are multiple uses of having this structure information available easily through a common API. So we have established a, a hub and platform uh, which, which allows you to access everything, a registry which uh, brings all the or registers all the different servers and data resources uh, and these uh, different servers which are shown here are beacons the hub uh, basically coordinates with these beacons and gets information and provides it to the users so we now have a working prototype that is being developed uh, in collaboration with Swiss model, Genome 3D, Uniprot, and Foldex teams. Uh, there is also a software to allow out-of-the-box implementation of 3D beacons, and we are developing that, and Ian is going to uh, present some of that information. Uh, and currently, we are uh, working on use case where, given a Uniprot accession or a range of residues, you can get information about a structure model that may be available in one or more data resources, including PDB. Uh, we will then follow it up with uh, a, a use case where you could provide a sequence uh, and, and get structure information. Uh, so all the software and, and API specification for 3D beacons is available on GitHub. So here you have uh, different URLs that you could look at for more information. So overall, what we want to achieve is a comprehensive uh, integrated infrastructure for structure data as well as annotations. So bring together theoretical models and the experimental models uh, through 3D Beacons Network, uh, get all the annotations uh, and make it into a knowledge graph so that our users are uh, can benefit from all the structure information that's available. Um, so that, that's the goal. And this work is done in collaboration with many, many teams. Uh, and there are many uh, here. Uh, I, and I also want to thank the, the funders uh, who have funded this work. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, and if there are questions, uh, we can take those if there is time, or we can go to Ian's talk on the 3D Beacons client. Ian, I think we can, we can go to you. Great, thank you. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to assume that everyone can see my slide so we don't have to go through the whole, can you hear me, can you see me, shout loudly if you can't hear me or see anything. Um, thanks, Samir. So uh, my name is Ian Siliso. I work at UCL with Christina Rengo. I'm going to be talking about one particular aspect of the 3D Beacons network, which is going to be the 3D Beacons client. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to give a little bit of history because I was, I was um, involved in another project uh, that is kind of related to the 3D Beacons client. So just as a bit of kind of context, uh, so I, was, I was involved in the, uh, the Genome 3D project, uh, which is a which was a UK based consortium that uh, provides consensus structural annotations and 3D models for sequences from model organisms, including humans. So there are some, uh, there are some similarities with the work that we're doing with the 3D Beacons uh, client. Hopefully this will kind of highlight them. So the, the, the Genome 3D project uh, was a collaboration between a, a set of uh, protein structure prediction groups uh, and resources, and also uh, structure classification groups, as you can see here. Let me just move, my, uh, move that out of the way. Um, and it's primarily uh, from UK, but um, uh, this is all started about 10 years ago, and then we kind of widened the, uh, widened the, the set of collaborators after that. 
So the idea was that we had these uh, protein structural annotation, protein structure classification resources, SCOP and CAF, that provided really well annotated structural domains within uh, the, the the proteins in the PDB. Uh, and we had a, a set of uh, protein structure prediction groups and algorithms uh, that that can you know provide us um, structural annotations on the, on those proteins. And if we wanted to, um, we wanted to get all of these um, uh, prediction groups to provide annotations on the same set of important sequences, so we can kind of get a consensus idea of uh, of where those predictions uh, might uh, be similar and where the, where they may differ and so on. And we asked all of these uh, structure prediction groups to use the um, SCOP and CAF templates, uh, sorry, the SCOP and CAF domains as their, as their templates, so we can kind of do this comparison. And that was the idea that we had this, um, essentially a web, uh, a web page that you can kind of search for a sequence that you're interested in from a, a, set, of, uh, a set of modern sequences, uh, and you get, your, you get a sequence, and then you can look at all these different annotations from those sequences. So this is, this is the page for a particular Uniprot sequence, where we have um, lots of different pr uh, prediction groups that are providing um, either domain predictions, where they just predict the start and the stop region of a structure, uh, where that structure is kind of one of the superfamilies from Kath and Scott. So this is kind of annotating, annotating a sequence to say a structure that looks a bit like this appears in this region. Uh, and we get different, um, we get a consensus view of that. But we also have this region at the bottom, a, a second type of prediction, which is predicting uh, actual 3D structures, so coordinates as well. So some some of these prediction groups uh, predict coordinates. And then if you were to uh, if you were to highlight these, then you can kind of superpose them all together and see where they where these predictions are similar and where they where they differ. So again, using this consensus idea. Uh, as, a, as a powerful tool to, to investigate structure. Now, there was a, um, this is one of the reasons why I'm mentioning this, because the, the, the data model is quite useful to, uh, to go back to in terms of where this is moving on to for the 3D beacons network. So we, we started out with the idea that you had lots of different prediction resource, resources that all provided lots of data um, in slightly different flavors. And then it was up to us to kind of collate all of that together and then push it out as a web page. Uh, then uh, at a separate project later on, we kind of changed that to, to have a, a push API. So we kind of got the prediction resources to, to push data to us for an API. So we didn't, so it's up to them to update their own data rather than us to kind of claw data from them. And how this relates to the 3D Beacons Network is that um, what the 3D Beacons Network is doing is essentially getting the prediction resources themselves to be able to answer those, those questions. Um, so that we're now kind of pulling data directly from these, from these resources, which is a much more uh, efficient way of, of doing things. So essentially we're kind of giving the, 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 you know, the, the tools to these resources to be able to talk uh, on, this, on this network. So then the, then the idea is um, also because it's part of a network, um, this isn't just about uh, enabling 3D beacons to talk to each of these uh, clients, but it's enabling anybody to talk to individual clients uh, because obviously we, we provide uh, an API, which is the, the language that allows people to ask questions and answers and anybody can ask questions and answers, which is uh, the, one of the extra useful things. Okay, so the 3D Beacons Hub, Samir's already uh, mentioned this, so I'm just kind of uh, going to skip over the, the various parts uh, within the 3D Beacons. So the hub is the, the, the main uh, port of call within the 3D Beacons network, and the hub will talk to the registry to find out where every, everything else is, where all the other nodes in this network. And the network are uh, comprised of 3D prediction servers, it also comprises of um, experimental data servers, uh, but it also allows that the hub allows uh, the users to um, to interact via like, manually via web pages, uh, but also uh, via APIs and so on to, to actually interrogate the data. So uh, the idea is that the, the hub is a central point for that that kind of coordinates um, the communication between between lots of these resources. Okay. So um, this is one of the one of the key points in terms of uh, it's kind of one of the key questions or statements that we're trying to uh, answer. So somebody will say, "I have three D models and I want to make them available for others to find and use in their research." Um, and what we're trying to do here is trying to trying to make that as uh, as easy as possible to to lower the bar to make that as easy as possible um, uh, for 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 everybody. So the question is, do you already have a web resource? 
And if the answer is yes to that, then probably the easiest thing is just to implement the, the API, the 3D Beacons API, to your existing web pages. Uh, so this is exactly what um, uh, PDBE and Swiss Model have already done. So in, in addition to kind of designing the API, they've actually implemented this to their existing web pages. But one of, the, one of the other things that we wanted to do was to lower the bar to allow anybody to uh, become part of this network. So maybe you don't. Oh, so maybe you don't already have a uh, a web resource. There should have been another slide there. Uh, maybe you don't already have a, a web resource. Uh, in which case, that this is where the the client comes in. Um, so the client is a pre-rolled uh, piece of software that should allow you to uh, manage your own um, structural predictions. Uh, and make them available on the uh, 3D network, 3D Beacons network. Just as a note uh, on the 3D Beacons API, so this, this uh, I've already mentioned, this provides a framework for, the, for, the, for all the questions and answers. Uh, it's uh, based on open API, which um, allows people to sort of generate their own code to, to build their own clients uh, via Swagger Hub. So if you did want to implement your API, there are lots of ways to try and facilitate that and make that as, as easy as possible. Uh, so again, this is um, Swagger Hub, which just basically allows allows you to to generate your own uh, code stubs for this if if you are looking to go down that route. So this is the other option that I'm going to mention more here. So if you if you if you don't already have a web resource, then the other option is to install the 3D Beacons client, um, uh, and that is that is what we're trying to to do here. So this allows users to store, browse, view their own 3D models. Um, and part of the, the one of the, some of the important steps there is to automate the the data ingestion steps that are that are going to be required to to provide data that is uh, that is needed by the 3D Beacons API. So some of the, some of these steps are going to be making sure that we have the um, the correct format. So making sure that we have MSIF and binary SIF formats and converting between them depending on which uh, file we start with, but also to provide these um, uh, scoring. Uh, that Ger Gerardo was going to be talking about later on. So we can kind of uh, compare models from different predictors uh, nice and easy. So we want to make sure that each of these models has accurate um, uh, scoring schemes, like for example, the Q-mean score. Uh, and also we need to make sure that all of these can be mapped to Uniprot via uh, an alignment, and this all needs to be normalized, and we need to make sure that the, the data is uh, good and sane and goes in. So one thing is adding data into this, but another thing is kind of keeping that data up to date. And this is one of the most important things is that these models are most useful when they're generated from very, very recent data. So part of the, the idea of the client is to try and make uh, try and try to make that as easy as possible for people to refresh their data um, without having to, to basically reinvent lots and lots of uh, software steps. And also, obviously, this implements the 3D Beacons API, which allows all of these models to be found on the 3D Beacons network. Uh, in terms of the software stack, very briefly, uh, so the idea is that there is a, a web server that sits in the middle of this, which implements the API and allows people to browse their own local models. Um, there is a CLI uh, integration, which allows people to um, maintain their database, i.e. to ingest their PDB files into, into the database as far as the, by the command line. Um, there is a local database for data persistence, and there's a pipeline which allows the local processing. So calculating the Q-mean score, for example, it isn't, um, it, you know, it requires computation. Um, and if you're doing that for lots and lots and lots of models, then we needed to build a, a processing environment that allows for, you know, a parallel processing environment. Uh, and this is all stuck together with Docker containers. So the idea is that it's, you have a, a single configuration file um, and all you need to do is download the software, download the, some, some uh, data libraries, uh, change your own configuration file, and then uh, run the Docker instance and everything works. Um, so th this is an example of the, the, the web pages that, um, that get automatically generated when, uh, when you start up the, uh, the web server. Um, so uh, in terms of what we're working on at the moment, so you know, we already have this uh, a working prototype of, uh, of all of those pieces glued together. Uh, and what we're working on at the moment is trying to implement lots of different uh, clients and lots of different data loaders to cover the most common use cases. So one of the examples is the, um, the David Baker uh, models that were generated from PFAM superfamily. So we're using that as a data set 
to try and load those models into a, uh, an example implementation um, to, to show this working. And obviously there are going to be lots of uh, different flavors of, of model structures. So that's gonna, so part of that is going to be, um, you know, uh, adding extra data loaders to, to make sure we cover all cases that are useful. Uh, also, one of, the, one of the things we're working on now is that though, particularly for the PFAM Baker data set, but maybe for also, uh, also for others as well, uh, this is one structure per alignment. Uh, and we, we're working on a workflow that will allow us to inherit that one structure to each of the sequences within that alignment um, as accurately as possible. And I suspect this will be something that we need to, that people will be interested in um, generally when applying that. And again, this is something that people probably wouldn't want to have to reinvent the wheel and do that themselves. So we're going to, uh, you know, come developing something that will work across the board with that. Um, we're very aware that once releasing a, a piece of software like this into the wild, then upgrades will be tricky in terms of upgrading software and upgrading people's local databases. Um, so we, we are doing extensive beta testing and we're very interested in um, any data sets that people have and anybody that is, that is interested in collaborating as being one of these integrations that we can work with to make sure that um, you know, everything works as best as possible before uh, pushing this out. So with that, um, just to thank everybody that's involved in this in this project, um, and I will pass you over to Gerardo. Uh, sorry, unless there were questions, are we? I, I I'm not too sure about time. Should we? Um, if we're just moving straight on, let's move straight on, and then we can answer all the questions at the end. All right, sounds good. All right, thanks Ian, thanks Samir. Um, let me set up the screen sharing and then we can get started right away. Um, so hello, I'm, I'm Gerardo. I'll be talking about the model quality estimates for, uh, for this project. Um, first things first, let me tell you a few things about, uh, about the group and the people that are doing the work. Um, so we are, uh, so I'm uh, in, in charge of any software development aspects within the group of Thorsten Schwede. Uh, we are part of the, of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, which is the Swiss uh, Elixir node. Um, we're running a, a number of services and software, the biggest one being Swiss model. Um, next to Swiss model, there's the Swiss model repository, which provides uh, pre-computed uh, models, uh, which also gives us a good amount of experience on how to produce those models and uh, how to make them available to other people. Um, we have a benchmarking service called uh, Cameo that I'll mention uh, later in the talk. We have a, a service to uh, deposit models, which is called Model Archive, um, which also gave us some experience on what is important when, uh, when one has a deposition system for uh, predicted models, what type of annotations are important. And the one thing which always keeps on coming up is, uh, is quality of the model. How do we know how accurate this model is expected to be? Because that's a very tricky uh, thing. Um, we have a number of software packages, um, Open Structure, Chroma 3, and Qmean, which will be the main focus of this talk. So Qmean is our software package for uh, model quality estimation. Um, from the people in the group, I, uh, I just want to stress the, the work being done by, uh, by Gabriel, who has done the latest versions of Qmean. Within this project, uh, Stefan has been doing the containerization that I'll mention later. Uh, Andrew is the one who implemented the 3D Beacons APIs into the repository, as Ian mentioned. And we have uh, Xavier that, uh, that is running Cameo, the benchmarking service. Now, if I um, before talking about model quality estimation, I want to point out on how do we even uh, tackle this problem. So before talking about how accurate uh, a model is, uh, we should define how do we even compare protein structures. And uh, as, a, as, as an example on uh, why this, this, this can be very tricky is that if, if I make a prediction of a, of a world leader and I look at historical examples, I might come up with an idealistic picture like the one here on the left. And okay, this is how a world leader is, uh, is, is looking like, so that's how I expect future world leaders to look like or current or recent ones. And if I take one of the recent uh, world, uh, world leaders, that might actually look like this. So now the question is essentially, how do I compare these two things? How do I compare the model that I predicted with the target? Where are they similar? Where are they different? And how similar or different are they? 
the same applies to to protein structures it's not always easy to um, to compare things when you look at, at, at structures so if i had here in this example um, a white uh, a protein structure in white in the background which I'll, i claim is the correct protein structure and on top of that i have in colors a, a model that someone predicted i can try to superpose them and i get to the conclusion that it's Perf perfectly fine on the top part and completely wrong on the bottom part. Um, but that's a bit short-sighted because if I was to cut them into two parts and superpose them separately, I see that also the bottom part is actually quite accurate. So the only part that was really bad was the relative orientation of the two parts and the region co connecting them. And so I would argue that a good way to, uh, to, to assess the similarity between these two structures is by the color gradient that you actually see on the structures, where uh, green would be uh, things that are very similar, and red would be the, the regions which are um, very different. And the coloring here is by a metric which is called the LDD team. It's a, it's a metric which, um, which works on, on looking at the neighborhood of each atom in the structure. So essentially, for each atom, I look at the distances to all the neighboring atoms, and I see how well they are conserved in a type of percentage style uh, score. So I get a, a number for each of the residues, and I can also combine all of that for a, a percentage type number for the whole, uh, for the whole structure. And get, that gives me a, a rather nice way to compare uh, structures. Um, there are other metrics that one can use, uh, RMSD or GDT being very popular ones, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. But for the, um, for the use cases that we talked about within this project, like the ones also that Samir mentioned, looking at analyzing variants, analyzing interfaces with other proteins or interfaces with ligands. It seems that often enough, the local neighborhood, a region of interest is really what, um, what, what is of interest also then for the users. Um, an additional advantage for, um, of scores like LDDT or also the CAT score, which is, which is fairly similar in concept, um, is that they are not dependent on a superposition because no superposition is needed to compute them in the first place. Uh, that makes it very easy to automatize this type of comparisons without having to worry about how the superposition works. And also they are all atom scores, which means that you can use them to assess the accuracy also of, uh, of side chains. So um, to sum up, within 3D beacons, we thought that uh, thinking of accuracy in terms of LDT is a good way to go. Now, the problem being that in the example before, I showed you I know the correct structure and I have a model on top of it and I'm comparing the two things. In reality, of course, I do not know the correct structure. So instead of being able to use the LDT metric, which is there to compare two structures, I now need a method that is able to predict what the LDT would be if I knew the correct structure. And that's the problem of model quality estimation. Um, so within the uh, model quality estimation, a method should be able to, for each residue, tell me what the LDDT score should be if I knew the correct structure. And that will give me a good idea of the accuracy of the model uh, if that works accurately. And I'll, uh, I'll argue that it can work quite accurately uh, in a moment. So uh, within the API, as a result, we have that uh, embedded that for each residue, uh, model providers are supposed to, to give such a quality estimate. Um, per residue, quality estimates are also nice because you can average them over a region of interest, or you can also average them over the whole structure to have a, a global um, number of, of the quality in general, and that works quite, quite well. Um, now, um, since we'll have models from many providers, uh, we wanted to make sure that whatever quality estimation method that we use, we want the numbers that come out to be comparable. Uh, like we, we need to be able to compare models. They, they shouldn't provide um, different styles of quality estimates. So for now, um, we, we kind of looked at what this QE method needs to be able to do. Um, it should be very fast because uh, there are model providers uh, like ourselves, um, which produce a large number of models. Uh, we have within the repository over 200,000 new models that are being produced every week. And all of those need quality estimations on top. So that takes a good amount of computation. Um, the methods, they need to be published. They should be continuously benchmarked. They should be open sourced and they should be easy to run. And preferably also to be run locally in a containerized setup, for instance, like uh, what Ian um, showcased as needed for the 3D Beacons client. 
And um, there can be a number of methods that could do it for now, also for, uh, for simplicity and convenience. We focused on one that we know very well, which is our own method, which actually fits all of those requirements. And I'm going to provide some details um, moving forward. So um, the, we, we have this, this method, which is called cumin discom It's a, a, a development of the Cumin family of uh, quality estimation scores. So Cumin has been around for, for a long time. And the latest iteration of that is, is Cumin disco where the, the, the additional aspect of, of, of Cumin disco is that it uses distance constraints. So for, uh, for a model structure, we, look, we try to find um, other proteins of, uh, with known structure that are homologous to the, to, the, to the sequence in the model. And based on that information, we try to see which, which regions are conserved or not conserved by looking at pairwise distances between residues within those, um, those structures. Um, and using this type of information, for instance, then if you had a model like the one colored here, you can find a, a loop region where you see that, uh, that this region is not well conserved compared to what we have found in other structures. And based on that, we conclude that the, uh, that the quality, uh, that the LDDT score at these residues um, would be predicted to be lower. And this also fits quite well then with, um, with reality as, as was tested in this case. Um, the method in the background, it uses a deep neural network uh, you, that mixes together all the features that we extract from the templates, additionally to those distance constraints. Um, it was trained very carefully and optimized um, to, to show that it works quite well. So at least at this point, I can claim that it works well, but to really give you a proper idea that it actually works well, uh, I need to do a little um, I need to go into the into the benchmarking world. So a good way to test these things is by looking at what comes out in the PDB. So every week, uh, as you, I suppose you all know, uh, new PDB structures come out. And four days before the structures come out, uh, the sequences of those structures are, are pre-released. And with this PDB pre-release, um, the service Cameo that we, that we run in, in, in the group fetches a, a number of sequences, sends them to 3D modeling servers. These servers provide predictions, um, predicted 3D structures, and those structures in turn are fed into QE um, servers that assess the quality of those models. So essentially then these servers are being asked to provide for each residue a number that is predictive of the actual LDDT that will be in the in the, in, the, in the final known structure. And once this is all done, um, the, the structures are released in the PDB. So before that, also Cameo has no idea how the structure looks like. And um, we can evaluate um, the, the, the predictions. And the evaluation in the, in the QE section is a, is a classification problem. So it, it looks at um, which residues are considered to be of high quality and which ones are considered to be of low quality when comparing with the real solution um, based on a, on a threshold in the, in the LDDT score. And then you look at the predicted values from all the participants and you see how well they solve this classification problem with um, uh, looking at uh, rock AUC or uh, precision recall AUCs. And this is what is shown on the, on the plot on, on the left over the past six months. Um, so within six months in Cameo, you get almost 4,000 models that are evaluated by various, uh, by various QE methods. And in, in, and in here, for this type of, um, of, of problem, we can see that Cumin Disco performs uh, really well. So the better performance being on the, on, towards the top right. Um, what, was, what was also tested in the, in, in the publication was how well Cumin Disco works for global uh, quality estimation. So if I look at the global LDT score and I compare it with just averaging all the local Cumin Disco scores per residue, I can see a very, very nice correlation as, uh, as displayed on this plot. Um, and uh, one extra note is also that Cameo uh, checks also the runtime, so or the, not the runtime specifically, the response time of the servers that uh, where the models are sent to. And um, Cumin Disco is also reasonably fast in that. So we don't do any internal tricks. It goes via the, uh, via, via the normal network and, uh, and 
this it's it's the same response time that any user could expect so you get you get your quality estimation back in, in 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 the range of a minute per model um so to um to sum to sum it up um what what does cumin disco have as as features it's high throughput um that's besides what i mentioned earlier in the run in the response time uh it's also simply by its use within uh, within swiss model uh so swiss model produces a lot of models uh every minute uh both from um, from user requests and also from what we run ourselves within the repository so you'll end up with uh, more than 20 million i think at the moment more than 20 models per day uh, per sorry per minute that uh, that need to be evaluated with, uh, with quality estimation so it's 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 you it we know that it works in high throughput um it's published uh, the publication came out early in 2020. It's continuously benchmarked as I, as I showed before. You can all check it out on the Cameo webpage. Um, it's open sourced. So te technologically speaking, it's a, it's a C++ library with a Python wrapper on top. Um, and it's available on, on this public Git repository linked here. Um, it's easy to use in two different ways. Um, on one hand, we have a web service uh, within the Swiss model webpage. Uh, it also has an API attached to it where you can upload your models and, uh, and get them evaluated. And uh, recently we put a, a containerized version of it that's currently available within the develop branch of, the, of our Git repository. And it can do all the flavors of Cumin, including the latest uh, Cumin Disco. Um, the tricky part with the Disco part is that uh, you need to have a template library for it. Since as mentioned before, it's, uh, you, you need to be able to compare with other structures that are homologous. And for that purpose, we have a weekly updated template library that is uh, extracted from our own Swiss model template library. And uh, our, our team maintains this and makes sure that every week this, uh, this library is updated. And so if you want to run it, all you need to have is Docker or Singularity installed on your computer. And then you just download the container, you download Uniclass 30, you download the QMTL and you provided the structure, optionally you provided the sequence and you get out the global and local uh, scores. And that's all that you need to run it essentially. And um, with this, I can, I can conclude with a simple reminder that uh, always keep in mind that models by definition are wrong, um, but some are useful. And with uh, quality estimation, we believe that you can get a step closer at finding out which ones are useful and which one not. So thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Gerardo. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Samir. Um, we have a question just coming on the Q&A. Let me bring that up for a moment. Carol has asked, how do you approach, how do you expect to cope with disordered structures in each approach, PDPE, 3D Beacon, and Cumin Disco? I think that's a question for all three of you. So I think, I think in the context of PDB knowledge base, uh, it, it's a annotation of the residues that may be intrinsically disordered. Uh, and then what you might find is we also have a structure of that specific protein in complex with something else. And in that case, the, the residues are ordered. Um, so I think this in the in the knowledge based context, we treat it as an annotation of a residue. And then we can look at different structures to see uh, what is the impact of, for example, forming complex versus having the structure on its own. Ian, do you want to say about 3D beacons? Um, yeah, so as far as the as far as the 3D beacons is concerned at the moment, we're restricting these kind of annotations to always include three-dimensional coordinates. Um, that's not to say that we uh, we there's not there's nothing to say that we couldn't potentially extend that to have annotations that talk about structural features that don't necessarily have associated 3D coordinates. Um, but at the moment, uh, at the moment, we we haven't included that. At the moment, we're just talking about um, structures with 3D coordinates. Uh, and in the case of disordered uh, disordered you know predictions, the 3D coordinates may not be as useful as the general annotation that this that this is a disordered region. 
and that's certainly something that you know we'd be interested in discussing further if people are interested in trying to add that Gerardo um, yes on the on the quality estimation part for uh, for disordered structures um, it, uh, it it depends on what signal you have uh, often enough they would like if a model would cover the disordered part in one of the many possible um, confirmations that it might take um, if, if if there is structural information available through through homologs it would pick it up via the distance constraints and, and provide it with a with a low quality score which might be in a sense misleading because there is no correct answer in a sense so uh, it just tells you that it's uncertain about the confirmation um so that's what i would expect on the on the quality estimation part but that's that's something that could be possibly improved by combining it with uh, predictions of uh, intrinsic disorder like done by the mobidb or this type of uh, tools okay thank you any other questions? Yes, we, we do. Um, let me read that for you. Is model completeness taken into account in the scoring? Uh, so I can answer that as like on purpose not. Um, so essentially a model, if it, if it uh, just covers part of the um, um, of the protein, um, we believe that's a separate kind of thing. Like the quality of the model can still be high uh, on average. It just happens to only cover half of it. Um, so it's um, so it's not taken it. Uh, it's it's not considered in the quality scoring. Uh, but the three D beacons uh, API provides you with the residues that are covered in a in a given model. So. Uh, combining that with the quality measure, you can make a decision as to whether you want to use that model or not. And and potentially build queries that say, show me all the models that are greater than a certain length, um, you know, but greater than a certain quality uh, score as well. And the third question has come in. How will end users interact with 3D beacons? Will there be a search facility where people can paste the sequence, for instance? Uh, so we we were, we are working on a prototype where you can search at the moment for unit uh, The and and I think we we will extend that to a to a sequence um, as as we address some of those use cases. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you for Christine for joining us as well. Um, just before we go, there is there might be another question. If you have anything else you'd like to add, I'd like to highlight that we this is the first in a series of webinars. Um, so there'll be more back later in the autumn, September, October, and November. So watch the uh, watch the web pages and keep an eye on on information as it comes out. There will be some more webinars from the three D Bioinfo community coming your way shortly. Um, and a, a question come in. We still have a couple of moments left. So if there's anything else on your mind, feel free. It says, how will users be able to compare experimental and model structures? Who would be best to pick that up? Um, I, I'm happy to comment on that. So that's going to come down to um, uh, the, the web pages on the on the hub, essentially. The, the idea that the, uh, the hub is going to provide these consensus ideas of, you know, you, you have a, a protein sequence, um, and then there are various annotations on that sequence, various, various predictions on that sequence. Um, and you can filter down those uh, predict the, the, the number of predictions based on a, a number of criteria, like um, quality score or size or anything I was saying there. One of those facets, one of those um, you know, pieces of information about that uh, prediction might be that actually this is an experimental structure rather than a predicted structure. So it may well be that in presenting the web pages, you only want to see predicted structures. Uh, it may well be that 
you know, you, you can say, I would prefer to see um, predicted structures, but maybe open up a tab to show me all of the structures um, if, uh, you know, if there aren't any experimental structures and so on. So I think that answer will uh, come down to the, um, you know, how, how the, the web pages are set out. And that's something that we already have the prototype there. Uh, and we are looking to extend the, the, the functional features of that. And I think that would be like a really, if, you know, if you're particularly interested in, in, in that, then getting involved um, and, and helping us to build those or at least specify those um, is strongly recommended. So we've, we've been involved in a number of kind of hackathons, um, you know, community work um, that uh, really encourages everyone to get involved to, to try and give us ideas about how we can incorporate as many different groups, as many different resources as possible. Um, so yeah, please, please do feel free to get in touch. Mm -hmm.